before I begin speaking on what uh, I'm, it was published that I would speak on, I would like to, to tell you about a project that I carried on with uh, uh, three undergraduates. In our department, we have what is known as a senior design course. And every undergraduate in that department in engineering, before he gets his diploma, graduates, has to participate in a semester course in a project which is sponsored by a company. And they pay a minimal cost to the department for the, for the travel and for the necessities. But uh, this was a, a most uh, interesting project that, that I thought I would bring, bring to you to see whether there's anything like that going on in Italy. Maybe there is, maybe you can enlighten me. Um, there is a, um, a clinic and hospital the service is a large area, and so people drive in and park. And there's a shuttle that has a about a three quarter, about a one kilometer uh, round trip. And during the one kilometer, it has about, oh, depending on traffic, between 12 and 18 stops. So it's go stop, go stop. And it occurred to me that that this would be an ideal place for regenerative braking to try to recapture the the energy. Of course, regenerative braking is done, you know, it's fairly commonplace electrically. Um, because of the, the, the particular situation, um, an electrical system was not, was not feasible. Uh, it does not have a sufficient energy density capacity to absorb and then to feed back to, to get the, the device going. And if we were to do it electrically, then it would take too large a battery pack and too large a motor and so on. So this was done hydraulically instead. Um, it, it, have you heard of hydraulic uh, regenerative braking? Have any of you heard of it? <coughs> okay, what happens is that uh, the, the, um, the drive shaft of the, of between the engine and the wheels is cut and there's a, a hydraulic pump motor that's put there. And there are two tanks, so on braking, the first thing that happens is that from the low pressure tank, the hydraulic oil is pumped to a high pressure tank, <clears throat> getting very high energy, compact energy ability. Then on, 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 a, on acceleration from, from the stock to go, the, the other side happens, the, the pump then now turns into a motor, <coughs> excuse me, turns into a motor, and it's a hydraulic motor now and this fluid Com uh, drives the motor, which drives the wheels. The, um, the, 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 the spring medium is, is I think it's, it's nitrogen. It's an inert gas, so that the, the fluid goes in, the nitrogen compresses, and the nitrogen pushes back, and, and you get energy back. Um, we computed that we could save, um, there's a lots, lots of work going on in the United States with this kind of, kind of uh, the Army is, is working on some of this, and uh, I understand that um, some of the delivery companies are working with some of this, like FedEx and things like that. But we computed that for our particular situation, we could probably save um, something like in the order of 30% of fuel cost. You know, it still has to go around. But we're becoming very attuned to fuel costs because we're now paying like 70 cents a liter for gas. And this is just insane in America. We, we can't afford to pay that kind of money for gas, for gasoline, uh, um, 70 cents of euro, euro cents. So I, I thought I would relate that because I found it most interesting. Um, these students, I got to, to pick the students out of the group, and they were the best. They were just the best. It, it turns out that because of the, the um, research nature of, of the project, but they're, they're not really implemented yet. Uh, I, there's a company that's working with Ford, and Ford in two or three years will come up with a, an option. You know, you want power steering, you want regenerative braking on your, on your shuttle, and uh, then it will be feasible. But at this time, uh, we were quoted something anywhere between uh, 300,000 and half a million for the controls. The, 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 uh, the equipment is, you know, a few thousand dollars, but the controls to know exactly when the 
pump kicks in, when the motor kicks in, at what level of pressure in the accumulator you have to cut out, cut in, and so on. That that is a is a very uh, well. It's it's tailor fit to the situation now because it's not a standard standard option. And these students not only uh, did the work that it took to to do the analysis, but they also hunted down some money, some research funds uh, from the government. So they were just phenomenal. Well. That's all I wanted to say about that. I, you had not heard of that, or had you here in? Oh, I heard something similar, but not based on uh, uh, gases, but on mechanical or electrical. Uh... Uh, yeah, mechanical, electrical. Yeah, and there's there's some flywheel work that's done and actually running, but I had not heard of of hydraulic hydraulic. No, uh, hydraulic. I had seen something in a in a journal, a not highly technical journal. And then when I was writing this, the shuttle, I said, well, this is the perfect application for it, so we did the project. <laughs> okay. Uh, next, if you'll turn it a little bit. Um, I'm a professor with the University of Illinois Department of, of um, Industrial, newly named Department of Industrial and Enterprise Systems Engineering. And my specialty area is um, hydroelectric power systems, and in particular, governors. Um, I began my, my, actually, my PhD thesis some, um, some, let's see, 69 minus 27, I guess, minus 29 is easier to do, is how many years ago this was done. And I've worked uh, uh, with, with, governors and research governors, research speed control throughout and published throughout this all of, the, all of the time. I was affiliated for a long time with the Woodward Governor Company. You may have heard, you may not. Uh, the Woodward Governor is a very popular governor with power equipment. Um, and, um, um, and, and so I, I thought that I would bring one of these works it's not a recent, it's not a most recent work that I'm presenting today, but it's one that received a most most attention. It uh, it was a prize paper, and it is being used in in uh, in manuals directing how to to do proportional integral derivative control. Um, as it comes to pass, when when uh, a when a project is begun, is when one thinks about a government or someone thinks about doing a project, the first thing is there's, there has to be a need. It has to be, what is it, uh, water, conservation, uh, irrigation, uh, uh, whatever it might happen to be. But it's, it's often, not always, but often, a secondary benefit of that then becomes power, power generation, hydraulic power generation. Uh, the Grand Coulee, for example, was an irrigation. Uh, the three, three Gorges Island in China, the, one of the recent ones, I believe that was strictly for power generation for development. But they're not always for power generation. Um, so that what happens is that the, 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 the civil work is done first. Okay, for, you do the civil. Here's what we need to satisfy the purpose that we're building this for. Then you look and say, oh, we have a dam. So long as we have a dam, let's go ahead and have some, some power generation. And, and then the mechanicals come in. And, and the mechanicals um, worry about such things as overspeed on their generators. They don't want the, the poles to fly out of the rotor. And you do that by, of course, uh, in case of a total, uh, total rejection, uh, total um, uh, demand rejection, say the main switch closes, they have to close the gates to close the amount or narrow the amount of water to the turbine. And so that there's another worry, in order to keep the overspeed down, you want to close the gates as fast as possible. But if you close the gates too fast, then you get water hammer that can burst the, burst the conduit. And, and even worse than that is the, the, the uh, the negative pressure, when the pressure weighs it, the negative pressure is really is always worse than the than the positive pressure. It can suck the the, the conduit 
shut. And this has happened, by the way, in a, in a plant in Japan. It, it, the, it took the pressure, but on the reverse way, when it was an under pressure, it just sucked the, the, the uh, conduit shut, and, and of course it uh, flooded everything. Um, so that here we are now with the civil designed, the mechanical designed, and they come to the controls engineer and say, oh, by the way, we have to control the frequency. So they're the last to come in, and they're stuck with whatever they have to do. So the, the, the civil and the mechanicals don't really understand what the controls can do. And I thought it might be um, a contribution to, to, to outline a very simple method by which mechanicals and, and civils can say, can look and say, oh, if we do this, then we get that. They get a certain um, rise time, settling time, a certain performance. Um, is this unit going to be stable? Is it not going to be stable? Uh, those, those kinds of answers. Okay, so uh, what I did was devise a, an, a uh, graphical method by which they could take parameters, mechanical parameters and, and civil parameters, and just enter them directly into this graph, and they could see then the stability issues and the, the, uh, the, um, the performance issues. Okay, so that, that's what this, this work is about. No one is sleeping yet, and I was waiting for those clean bush jokes, but okay, I'll keep an eye out. Um, just a, 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 a short outline of, of the system we're dealing with. We have an upper reservoir and a lower reservoir. Uh, water flowing from one to the other. There's a dam here somewhere, and there's a, a turbine and a generator the generator supplying a load, with the turbine being underneath the level of the lower conduit to prevent cavitation and issues of, of that type. Um, I'm defining certain variables here. I have uh, M is the, the, the mass of, of, the, of the conduit. As you can see, that's a mass of water. So, uh, there's a Newton law that applies to that, F equal ma, right? That's that's how you would you would uh, um, model a, a conduit. Um, M is the, the the mass, and Q is the flow in in cubic meters per second. Okay, flow. Um, on the generator, we have a load, which is the resistive load, or a, that that resists the rotation. Uh, we have a generated moment. Uh, I see that I used M twice and I shouldn't have. Uh, we will not be using this M, but M will be the torque which is generated by the torque turbine. X is the rotational speed. And uh, the modeling, uh, you can see that we have, this will be an F equal MA, a, a Newton type of situation. <coughs> In fact, M times S being the Laplace transform operator, the DDT, uh, so M times the uh, the change in 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 flow M change in flow is equal to a, to a pressure. Uh, this equation uses the bottom pressure pushes up, therefore it's a negative sign. The top pressure pushes down, and I used it zero because I just because it's the reservoir level and. And so I, it, it needn't be zero, but here I used zero. Then the other equation, which is a simple equation, would be uh, a, a rotational Newton, Newton equation, right? Torque equal, equal the, the uh, rotational inertia uh, times, the, uh, times the x dot, x being the speed. Okay. So we have these two equations. There are two, uh, you can already see that this is going to be a, a rather simple second order system, right? Two equations. In addition to that, there's the, the uh, behavior of the turbine, and the turbine is, can, is defined by, by four parameters, 
the, the, the torque that it delivers, the flow that goes through it, the speed x at which it rotates, the, the y being the gate position, the control to the turbine is y, and h being the pressure at this point. Uh, actually, it's the pressure at this point minus the pressure here, but the net pressure h. So we write all these equations. This is, this is some, some, some function, some nonlinear function, and they're normally found in nonlinear characteristics of the turbine. You get a bunch of curves, and you can linearize at a point and do a, a partial derivatives at that point and, and come up with linearization of these nonlinear functions at a point. So uh, then we, we would model this as here we have the, 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 um, the rotor dynamics, right? uh, T times the change in the, 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 the uh, derivative of speed is equal to torque generated minus the load torque. Okay. And for my particular analysis, I recognize that the load is not a, is strictly a constant load, but it can, it can vary with speed itself. So I have included um, a, a constant C that describes how the, how the load itself changes with speed. Uh, all of the prior works prior to mine it, it did not do that. It, they, didn't, they, they assumed some, some constant load and then a low, full load rejection that was dropped and you do an analysis, you do a, a simulation of that, and that's the worst case. Okay. Then the second equation would be this one, which is the, the convert equation. It's nothing more than that, that uh, the um, F equal MA equation that we discussed before. And here we have then the two equations for the, for the turbine in linearized fashion. And those partial derivatives you get directly from turbine data. Actually, not from the turbine itself, but before a turbine is is built, there's a prototype, a, a model built, which is usually a, a one foot diameter, 10 inches diameter, 16 uh, half a meter diameter, something like that. And then there are the similitude relations that if this one behaves like this, this was actually tested. If this one behaves like this, then by the similitude relations, that big one will behave in such a, such a fashion. And fluid people know how to do this thing. Okay. Um, if we take, if we look at the system, say, what are we interested in? We're interested in keeping the speed at a constant rotational speed, right? We'd like to see 50 hertz here, is it 50 hertz in, in yes. Europe? 60 hertz in the United States. Um, that's what we would like. And how are we going to do it? Well, we only have one control, only one knob to turn. We can't change the level of the reservoirs, so the only thing we can do is, is Y, right? Change Y. Okay. So if we control people like transfer functions. So what we want to do is take these equations and start eliminating, eliminating parameters until we arrive at a transfer function. So you take these four equations and eliminate everything except x and y. You would have the transfer function x divided by y would be, you can, we don't have to go through this, but if you do go through it, you will find that that's what you get. Okay? And it, what, are we, what we have left is all of the, the various parameters. We have all of the, the partial derivatives, and we have, by the way, what we've done uh, for, the, um, for, for the rotor, we took the, the, the rotational inertia and the reference values and put them all into a, a time constant, which we call TA. You recognize that if this is this is a per unit equation, per unit deviation equation. This has no units. X has no units. The D has units per unit time, right? D, the derivative, DDT. And therefore, T has to be time to balance out. So we have a time constant here. And we also have a time constant here. So we have two time constants and the parameters. And there it is. Let's go to the second slide. This is amazing, the percentage even of people awake. I, I can't believe it. In my classes, they're, they're all asleep by now. I apologize for dragging you through this, this math assembly, but it's necessary to see how I 
massage the equation to arrive at, at this graph that, that you know, humans can look at and understand. Okay? Um, I, I've just repeated the, the equation from, from the last slide here so we don't lose sight of it. Then we look at these partial derivatives and it comes to pass that there are some standard partial derivatives. Uh, for example, the dq dh and the dm dh, they're from the similitude relationship. dq dh is one half. And no matter what turbines you use, that's, it's one half. And the MDH is three halves, no matter what you use. Okay? So I inserted all of these, these um, standard parameters, and it narrowed down to what looks like this. Okay? Uh, you note that I've kept one of the most important parameters, the MDY. The MDY is the rate of change of torque delivered by the tur turbine with respect to speed. So if the speed changes, the turbine changes, uh, uh, the amount of torque delivered changes. And also, of course, kept the, the C, because C is the regulation of the load. This is the turbine regulation, this is the load regulation. Meaning that if we change speed, the torque that we see reflected from the load changes. Okay? So we have two two regulations here, the others are all turbine parameters. Okay? Um, just to give you an idea of, the, of the, 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 the load regulation, if for example we have a resistive load, let's look at a resistive load here. Okay? If we're feeding a resistive load, a huge light bulb, just strictly resistance, okay? if we're feeding that and if it were to be acting at a speed, if it were to be running at a speed which is too high, then what happens? What happens is the regulator, the, the voltage regulator, has time constant which is a tenth of the time constant of this huge turbine. It's, it's much faster on, uh, on the generator. The voltage regulator is much, so it keeps the voltage the same. Keeping the voltage the same means that the current to resistive load is the same. It doesn't change. However, the turbine delivers torque times speed. Agreed? It, the, the power out of, a, out of a mechanical power is torque times speed. So if the speed is high, the torque is low. Right? The delivered torque. Okay, that, that gives a, a, a resistive load has a, a minus one as a C, which is destabilizing. If the speed is high, you want to, yeah, it would be destabilizing, okay? All right. So the, the various type of load, if you have a, an, a motor type load, if you have a, a motor that's, rushing, that's crushing rock, uh, the higher the speed, the more the, more the torque uh, that needs to be used. Um, as their speed and says, yes, uh, this is a C, so one must choose a particular C. What kind of load are you going to use? That's what, that's what you choose for a C. Uh, I took this, this quantity, which is, um, which is load regulation and turbine regulation, and put them together and called it a regulation, a full total system regulation, but not only did I do that, I scaled it by TW over TA. Okay? If I do that, then this, equation breaks down to this one. I, I'm, what I'm trying to do is get rid of all of the parameters so we, it's tractable then, it's easy to use. Okay, so we start with this, which has now gotten rid of the, uh, of the C and the DMDN the because it's now a K. There it is. On the next slide, I begin with that. Well, actually, I began with, uh, with the government. Uh, this is the last slide with all the equations, by the way, so please bear this one, and then we'll get into the more fun stuff that we can see what's going on. If we use a, uh, if we use a proportional plus integral plus derivative governor, um, Kp, times k over s times k d proportional integral derivative 
is the transfer function of the governor. And if we eliminate the derivative, then we can simplify it to this. Now, is it reasonable to eliminate the derivative control? Um, you can do all of the tests and simulation you want and arrive at an optimal derivative control. Okay, and we can say, sure, the derivative control does a lot better because it allows us to crank up the proportion and integral, the solution, uh, it, it becomes more stable, uh, becomes more stable and, and better performance and so on. Then you go and put it on the plant and you find that, oops, that's a derivative control. You can't really use it because it shakes the equipment to pieces. So it, it's not possible to use. Then when you get on plant, you have to go ahead and tune the proportional and integral and, and some derivative and you put the derivative to the point where, where it, you're not wearing out the equipment, right, from vibrations. Derivative controls are bad for vibration. Okay, so not, not using the derivative control, that becomes, um, the transfer function is this. Um, if we unite this transfer function with the plant transfer function, we get this, and this is the then the open loop transfer function. We have control, plant, unity feedback, control, plant, unity feedback. That is the open loop. Okay, the open loop, as we know, is the is the control engineer's starting point if he's going to design a controller, because all of the linear methods uh, are based on open loop. Okay, so. But this open loop still looks a little bit untractable. Okay. So what I did at this point, I said, well, what if I scale frequency? If I scale the frequency, can I simplify that? And in fact, I found that if I use instead of, instead of the frequency S, I, start, I used a new frequency, which was TWDS, then note how much I've simplified the, the transfer function. Now, obviously, once I find a P and an I, I have to come back and, and in order to find the actual parameters, I have to use work these backward, right? But at this point, I've been able to simplify to the point that now I have two poles, which is a power pole from the conduit. I have a speed pole, which is the regulation pole, and I have Unfortunately, look what we have. We have a non-minimum phase system. We have a zero in the right half plane on a, on a Bode analysis type thing. A zero in the right half plane is bad news because we know that the roots of the characteristic equation will eventually, for sufficiently high gains, will eventually migrate to the zero and that side is unstable, right? So now we're getting to the issues of stability. Um, if, if I can take this equation now and put it in a form that the civils and the mechanicals are able, they certainly are able to take, the, they know what TA and TW are, and they certainly are be able to do this simple calculation and uh, arrive at backward one, once we have the parameters we want. But anyway, here, here I am with P and I and the K, which is the regulation, it, that's the, the open loop. So now I'll go to root locus. Okay, and see, what, what can I do? What, sh what should we do to, to, uh, to be able to predict what happens? This is the next to the last one, so breathe easy. Okay. And this becomes more interesting if you, if you know controls. This is quite understandable. What's nice about this paper, what's wonderful about this paper is that once I get my undergraduate through most of the year of, of control systems, most of the semester, I can assign them a project using this paper or they can understand reading this paper. There's nothing highly um, esoteric or difficult about it, but yet it made a contribution that, that I was trying to make. Okay, let's look. As we said, there's a power pole, there's a there's a um, speed pole, and there's the non-minimum phase zero. Okay, there are three situations. Let's say that k is less than two. You recall that k and two, here they are. Okay, I repeated the transfer. If k is less than two, then we would have um, a 
pole here, and uh, the, the speed pole here, S is for speed, P is for power, the power pole here, and then the zero out here. If K is, sorry, that's for K greater than two. For K between zero and two, we would have a power pole here, a speed pole here, and a zero. And for K less than zero, we have a power pole here, and the speed pole would be in the right half plane and unstable, and then we have the, the non-minimum phase here. You know, this situation is very interesting. What does it tell you? It tells you if the, if the feedback breaks for some reason, the system is gone. It goes unstable. It's open loop unstable, right? There it is, open loop unstable. Um, so we have three cases, one, two, three. Okay. I used, in order to design a controller, I used a, the, uh, a pole canceling. You cancel the slow plant pole, the slower the plant poles. Now, obviously, we cannot, in this case, we cannot cancel that pole because you never cancel exactly, perfectly. You don't know where the pole really is. You kind of design where you think it is. And if we plunk a zero on top of this, then there will be a root locus between the two and the system is unstable. So we can't do it. We cannot do it here because we're right on the j omega axis. And likewise, you can, you, we can put a zero right on top of that, but we don't know that that pole is exactly there. It's more or less there. Okay, so we can't do that. But here we certainly can. Okay? We, we can do it. We can cancel, in this case, the speed pole. And then we would have pole, pole, and zero. And we know that the root locus goes between the two poles, breaks away, and then goes around the zero like this, right? That, that would be the design. Um, I decided, in order to, to do a sensible stability on this, I decided to choose, arbitrarily, I chose the 707 um, damping factor. 707 damping factor will give a peak overshoot of 5%. Okay? Um, it's not really desirable. It's, it's a little more than, we would rather have no peak overshoot. We would rather have a deadbeat, really. If, if, but, you know, for at least this will clue us in whether this system is controllable. It, it will tell us, can we, can we get there? Can we get close to it? So, um, so doing these various things, then I said, well, if this is the case, uh, I, I didn't carry on the design for each one, but just in region two, region two, K is less than two, okay? If K is less than two, then you have pole, pole, they come together, they break away, go around the circle, and as I did the analysis, obviously I had the pole, which is the zero that I placed, I over P, canceled the pole, which is this one, I canceled the speed pole, that's pole cancellation. So I'm left with this as a, as a transfer function. Okay, that's the open loop. I took that open loop and I said open loop plus one is the characteristic polynomial. Open loop plus one is the characteristic polynomial. Here it is. But the characteristic polynomial, I want it to be equal to a second order characteristic polynomial where I am choosing zeta, the damping factor, to be equal to 0.707. Okay. If I do that, and I, all I need to do is to equate, I have one equal one, which is not highly informational. But I have a, 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 a P here, and I have an omega N here, so I can, I can, I can actually solve. I have the same number of, of unknowns as equations. And if you solve this, you will find that P is 0.38, and omega N is 0.87 over TW. And, there, and I over P, of course, is the, the zero that I used to cancel the pole is equal to K. Okay. So I said, okay, so. What are we doing here? We're doing k greater than 2, which is not what I meant to do. I meant to do k between, this is the one I was doing, k between 0 and 2. So I have a graph. I put k, the, this is the regulation. Here it is between 0 and 2, between 0 and 2. P is 0.38. Here it is, 0.38. Okay. 
Okay, so I made a graph of that. Okay, point three eight. What is what is I? Well, I is KP from that relationship. So in this area, from here to here, I can get P directly from the graph, and I can calculate I as I equal KP. Then to get the actual gains that I want, I have to take I and P and take them back through that, through that multiplication that I did in order to simplify the equation. And now I have the gains KP and KI, and those are the ones that go into government. Okay, I will not bore you with, with the others, but a, a similar way um, for this one, this one was this one. Sorry about that. Yes. Um, as I say, I did this, I did this last week, and uh, I, at 69, I can't remember what I did last week. I remember what I did when I was a child in Rome, uh, 60, uh, 65 years ago. That I can remember. But <laughs> um, so for each one, then I found the. the the P curve, the P curve, and I selected how I should be selected, or I did, showed how high I should be selected, and then take P and I through this, and you get the gains, KP and KI. Um, in, in addition to that, we have this equation. This, this equation will give us omega n, right? You have two coefficients to equate, so you can equate omega n. And omega n turns out to be 0.87 over, and so I did a, a um, omega n over um, TW. Then I did a rise time. A rise time is is 1.8 over omega n. Okay. The, 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 if you if you look at at a, a typical transient, the rise time is the rise time 90 percent. How long it takes to get there? A pretty good indication of how fast this this unit is going to be responding under the limitations of the pressure. For the for the conduit, right? And so I also put this this curve, which is the rise time divided by TW. It's scaled, but they know how to multiply back out by TW since they have that number. And that gives us some idea then. So they can tell, can this unit be controlled? Well, the answer is it's difficult here, it's okay in here, it's very good here, but there's a there's a stability limit. You cannot go back. So if you're designing your plant with a mechanical and the civil back here, don't ask the control engineers to bail, to bail you out. They just cannot control that plant. Okay. With the type of load, you would have to, in that case, you would have to change the type of load to make it not so resistive, more of a motoring inductive type of load. And, uh, okay. So let's let's do a quick example. Okay, let's assume that we have a TW of two, a TA of four, and a DN DX of eight. These are quantities that have to be entered. This is gotten from the turbine, and so we know this at control time. We know this. We know that, and we may or may not know that. Because oftentimes, when the unit is built, there's no load out there yet. It's going to develop. At other times, it might be an aluminum smelting outfit, and you know exactly what the load is going to be. Okay? If you don't know, then you probably assume C a minus 1, which is the worst case, and go with it. Okay? But you know, with these numbers, then knowing the MDN and C, you recall this is the turbine self uh, regulation. This is the load self-regulation. We put it together and get a K. Get a K, and we we uh, scale that to get to by T W over T A T A over T W scale, whatever it was. Five minutes ago, I can't remember, right? Um, and it turns out to be 0.5. So now we have a K of 0.5. Where we look at here's our graph. We look at K of 0.5. Where's K of 0.5? Well, K of 0.5 is uh, right. 0.5, here it is. At 0.5, we read I, we read P. P is, 0.5 is 0 0.38. 0 0.5 is 0.38, right here. Okay, and then, then we use the, this to find I, and we work them back, and we arrive at, at a KP and a KI. Uh, we note that um, 
we can find a system frequency, and with a system frequency, then we can find it uh, with a K. We have the K, we can find the TR. I'm sorry about that. That to find the the let's go back to this in region two PS point three eight four four point five point five oh point five is here. It's positive point five. Okay, it's a positive point five. Nah, good. Okay, a positive 0.5, so we're at 0.5, there it's 0.38, here it is 0.38, right there, and, um, and then there I is KP, so we can find I is KP at 0.19, and we also can find TR over TW, and so we have a, a rise time. Okay. So we can find all these things in a very simple manner. All we need to know is three or four parameters, and we can enter this graph and get back the governor gains one. The performance can be assured to be, can, will, it, will we be able to operate or not? And if so, what will be the, the, the rise time, the, 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 uh, the performance index? Um, as, as a, the question is, so you got some numbers. How do we know that after we spend millions and millions of dollars, that actually going to be like that? And obviously, uh, when you send these papers for review, they say, ha ha, uh, show me. And so I went back to some of the works that had already been done by Woodward Governor, gave me this data. And uh, I got the particular data that I needed. I actually had the actual parameters or uh, delinearization for the turbine. And let's look for three cases one, two, three. Here, we have, these are the ones that were done by simulation for design of the system. The engineers did that. Here are the ones that, that, that my paper would predict, this, this work would predict. And we see that KP of 2.2, and it's 1.62 here, 0 0.25, 0 0.18. 1.11, 1, 0.2, 0 0.12. Um, 1.3, 1 1.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.15. I, it, it, you know, I don't know whether in, in your uh, experience you think these two num numbers are too far apart, but they're not. They're exceedingly close together. This does a very, very good job at, at predicting what is going to happen. Um, in, in fact, um, um, it, it's, it's been used for st the, the standards that come out that have referred to this paper for this design because of that. So that's my presentation, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for listening. Thank you for staying awake. And <laughs> thank you for remaining in the room. <laughs> uh, do you have any, if we want any comments or questions? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Two questions. Okay. Uh, how much the partial derivatives uh -huh. may change in the normal range of operation of the two bar? Okay. So second question. Yeah. <coughs> when uh, pla uh, power plant is in, uh, in, the net, in, in, in the net, in the power system, can we guess the value of C? In which way can we guess the value of C? We do not know the, the actual load. The, the load is uh, everywhere. Yeah. Okay. Um, for the first question, the, you notice that I used only one, one partial derivative, which was the partial derivative of turbine with respect to speed. Uh, yes. Okay. Two of the others, I are not included, but I said to you, or I suggested that because they're related to the similitude relations, they're one half and three halves, and those are, are always, no matter where you get them, that's, that's what they are. Okay. Then you have the partial of speed and, and of, um, and of um, the, the partial of torque and flow with respect to, um, are the others. Here they are. The partial of torque with respect to gate and the partial of um, 
talk with respect to speed. The, these, this one is always fairly close to one. Fairly close to one. It always happens. That's, that's where they are. Like a, a gasoline engine is a, uh, is a hundred, is a 50% per second engine or 100% per second engine. It doesn't matter whether it's a large one or a small one. It's always that number. And a diesel engine is always either 50 or 100. I don't remember which is which. But they're always that number. Okay, the time constants. No matter whether it's large or small, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. and, and likewise, these, these are, are fairly uh, the same. The, the, um, but by experience, I found that the most important partial is the partial of, is, is the torque with respect to speed both with the turbine and with the, the load. Those are the ones that are very important. The others, yeah, they vary. You're correct. They vary. But they don't affect the results. So, you know, it's, it's OK. Um, you should never have given me two questions at a time. <laughs> the second? Uh, was about C, the value of uh, uh, yeah. activeness of the load. Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. M most often. The, the, the network is not there, and one does not know what the network is going to be. So one must protect himself by using a most conservative case, and the, 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 the resistive case is the most conservative, so you use C equal minus 1. In, in fact, this, the C minus 1 is specified, is what's given in specification. When one writes specification, we want to see the, the transient for C equal for a resistive load. Um, I might also mention that, that all of this work is very is, is conservative, um, is actually I, I had in my notes to say something about the, uh, the MDY and the QDY, they're, they're assumed to be one, but they're not highly, uh, those other two partials, they're not highly uh, sensitive, the system is not sensitive to those. Um, but the work is, 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 what I've done is very conservative. Number one, you recall that I did not use the derivative gain. The derivative gain, if I can use it at all, will stabilize and make the system faster. So it, it will do better than that. Okay? So it's not the other way where I can get in trouble. It's, it's rather conservative. Okay? The other, um, um, the other is that, the case that I used is an isochronous case. Um, isochronous means that the speed comes back and operates the governor, which operates the, the turbine, uh, the gates, which, and so on. Typically, there's a, there's, there's, uh, there's a control, like a droop control around the, the governor, or a regulation control around the entire system that, that shows that, that is a stabilizing effect. It's, it's another feedback um, for regulating the amount of power that you want to go out. And so there's an additional feedback which is also stabilizing. They're called regulation or, or droop. Those are the two names that are given to them. It, one uses one or the other. So it's, it's, both of those cases means that it's, that it's conservative. There is one issue which is, takes it that you have to watch out for, which is not conservative, and that's you don't go from the governor to the turbine directly. There has to be a power device there, an amplifier, um, a, um, a servo mechanism of some type. And the, the time constants of the servo mechanism can be, it, it's, they can be, their uh, model is a double pole. But they can be as, as high as uh, a third, even one half, of the system frequency, of the, of the control of the system, not the system of the power lines, right? We're not talking about that. We're talking about the mechanical time constant. Well, when you get up to one half, you no longer have a dominant pole pair because this will affect the dynamics of, of the overall loop. And so in that case, well, it wasn't analyzed, okay? <laughs> But that is that is de destabilizing in nature. Uh, hopefully, the the uh, 
the stabilizing effect of the derivative control can correct somewhat for, somewhat for later. Did you, Anything else? Did you investigate uh, a different control type with respect to... A, a different type of controller? Uh, um, for, for this same system or for different yes, systems? For this system. For this system, I, I have not, but they come through on papers all the time. I mean, we see them coming through and, you know, we... <laughs> I'm, I'm an editor for the uh, um, transaction on energy conversion of IEEE. And so we get these papers, and I've, I've seen these things. Um, from experience, a well-tuned PID cannot be beat by very much. Right. Uh, they make good papers um, as far as implementation. Yeah. A, a proportional integral derivative control, a well-tuned one, will do as well as about anything. This, you know, from experience. Be obviously. There are self-tuning controllers because as you go from one power point to another power point, uh, the, the, uh, the C uh, or the K changes, right? So what you have designed at one point may not be true at some other point in the, in the load curve. Agreed. Well, you should be, you know, smart enough, so to speak, to to take several points along the power curve and assure that you have good stability and good response all along that. Now, a, as far as governors, an intelligent governor obviously is a different story, right? It's, but at any one point, the intelligent governor is not going to do any much better than this. But that's, that's, that's a very good question.